finally, see, see, Michael picture looked like Michael. Yeah? <laughs> Something from his, really? That actually looks like Michael, doesn't it? Yeah. So if you walk back to speak, you say, oh, that's Michael Storm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, big thank you to Michael Storm. I mean, Michael was uh, literally, I think, from, from New York, and then was yesterday or this morning he was in New York, Zurich. I was coming from New York and yes. had a stopover in Zurich. Yes, sorry, because and then you're flying back to Zurich and Munich. Yeah, so so I've literally flown in for this this meetup. So Michael's the MD of Skeladry for EMEA, um, and uh, if 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 you're interested in social media, then there's some hashtag <coughs> London Safe. That'd be great. Uh, or you've got Michael's uh, Twitter handle as well. That would be super as well. And without further ado, let me hand over to Michael. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you very much for inviting me. Wow. Basically, we talked about the uh, community in, in London and there's offered to do that. And then when he called me, oh, when can you be here? I basically had no plans to come to London and I had, we have a safe program consultant training in Munich next week. And I said, okay, let's make that happen and, and arrange that. So I was just flying in for that meetup. And thank you very much for coming, for learning. Uh, for maybe experimenting with, with SAFE as well. I have a lot of support with me, you, you see. That's ART. ART, an agile release train. We call it this, this small yellow guy here, ART. It's basically, it's very good to hold your cell phone <laughs> or like this. But he also likes adventures and, and there's also a hashtag on it. So if you want to have an ART, there are some here waiting for you. Feel free to grab one and tweet where Art is and what he's doing. You'll find some, some interesting pics uh, online. So, we talk a little bit about SAFE, SAFE foundations. But the first thing I want to know, how much experience do we have in the room? I would ask you to quickly stand up, please. We do a, a, an exercise. And now, oh, there are some pick people in here. So please sit down if you have little or no experience about SAFE. So if you don't know what it is. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. That really helps me a lot because uh, Des and I will be able to answer some of the questions. If you have some experience, please sit down. If you are experienced, as a safety it, it's up to five. <laughs> <laughs> if you are very experienced, how many years? Yeah, how many years? Like what's experience? If I would say ten, ah. it would be challenging because safe was not there. <laughs> Three years. Experience. Three years. Oh, good. And experts, let's change here. Yeah. <laughs> Good, but I'm very happy that some of you don't have a lot of experience because we already talk about the foundations and you see we also have experts in the room who can share some of the experience and we also have a discussion so it's not the goal that I'm talking all the time. And we certainly have some time afterwards with pizza uh, to talk about some <coughs> challenges maybe or what you face or what you think because I'm also interested what you think and what you heard about SAFE and, and sometimes we, we hear stuff but we also need to experience what is, what is going on. So when you look at these outcomes of a retrospective, you see some yellow sticky notes up here. Which one is most or, or as close as possible to your environment. What do, do you hear in, in your company, in your organization? Hard to manage. Hard to manage distributed teams. And we work in distributed environments, right? It's just reality. That's what we do. Visibility. Visibility. Too little visibility. Visibility in regards to what? In terms of the team's um, understanding of the, the project we're actually on. What they're working, predictability. Yeah, I'd say the same. Yeah. I can't really say that they worry too much about some of the other things there because they don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Problem discovered too late. Problem discovered too late, which sometimes then leads to late delivery. Definitely. Sometimes. Can happen. Do you hear that one? Underestimate dependencies. That also often leads to that one, late delivery, problems discovered too late, because we integrate oftentimes very, very late in the progress. 
an integration of the different parts of the different components is very essential to make the system work because each team can work individually and it works very well. Maybe we have our own test environment, whatever, but as soon as we integrate it and put it together, then we have the problems and the explosions and that's what's causing a lot of delays and then a lot of time to fix and arrange everything, right? So, interestingly, these kind of problems it's always about the same. So in, in a lot of organizations, there are very, very similar problems. And when we look at how can we address that and who is involved in building the right environment, it's one of my favorite quotes from Edward Stemming. It is not enough that management commits themselves to quality and productivity. They must know what it is they must do. Such a responsibility cannot be delegated. And I was thinking a lot of how to explain it. Management needs to build the environment and, and question certain elements. And then I came across a story of newspapers. Anyone still reading paper newspaper? Yeah? yeah? Anybody? Or who loves the format of newspaper? The smell. The smell. Mm. But for me, it's really annoying because just to turn pages here, it's falling down or uh, then in the airplanes, that's my, that's my favorite. So someone sitting behind me, reading the newspaper and putting it in, in the back of my head, happened. Or my second favorite, turning the page and spilling the coffee over my stuff. So not really usable format, right? Do you know why we have the format of newspapers? Any guesses? I will not spoil it. Oh, you, you heard it. Why do we have this format of newspapers? Uh, he heard uh, the story from me before. So we, we just we, we met uh, about four weeks ago in Minsk, where I did a very similar talk. So he knows the answer already. Spoiler. So the problem was in the 1600s. Newspapers had the size, and this is what I don't like, I like it to make fire. So newspapers had the size of yeah. still paper book. And then in 1712, government introduced a tax on the number of pages. <laughs> we are smart people, right? We would do that. We would put a policy in place to make bigger pages, more content on a page. Totally fine. Nothing bad with that. But the interesting part is now that in 1855, this tax was discontinued. And the format didn't change. Even if it's not really usable. And when you transfer that now to your environment, who is working in a financial services organization? Good. How many policies and standards do you have? Do you have an idea? Measured by the yard. <laughs> a lot, right? I worked with one day, had about 1,500 policies and standards. And then we started to think, yeah, policies and standards, they have a positive effect, yes, newspapers, save taxes, but some of them are not current anymore. So who can change policies and standards? What do you think? Leaders. Managers. It's not the testers, the developers who can change uh, these this policies and standards. And they, the leaders, the managers, they build the environment where we can be successful. That's what they need to do. And when we talk about Agile, it's embrace the lean Agile mindset. Des mentioned it before. Agile manifesto. We need to understand what's behind there. <coughs> then help to implement the practices lead the implementation when we talk about SAFE, it's really the leaders who need to be involved. If we don't have management and leadership support, I've not seen a successful implementation of SAFE. And then you get the results. And leadership is responsible for that as well. <coughs> so leadership has a key part in agile adoptions, to agile transformations, and also SAFE adoptions. So we've seen this one. And it's always good to learn, again, what's here, by the way, there are a couple of principles behind that. 
always good to read as well, some very good information. And as Des mentioned, it's not only software, it's basically value delivery. So we see in SAFE much more adoption now in systems building where hardware is involved as well. But you can deliver everything with it. We also look at the, the house of lean. I will not go into the details, but you see the goal is not to implement lean and agile, and it's not to implement safe. The goal is to create value. And lean, agile, scrum, Kanban, safe, they are tools who help us to do that, to create value. And we need leadership support to do that implementation. They need to understand what it is. They need to be trained as well that they have a good understanding because there's a lot of fear of stuff which we don't know. And when you look at SAFE, there are nine SAFE principles. Anybody been to a SAFE training, SPC or leading SAFE training? Good. Which is your favorite principle? Which one of the, the nine? Eight. Eight. Unlock the intrinsic motivation of knowledge workers. Why would you say that? Part of the reason for wanting to adopt a method like this is because it's very easy for, as we talked in the first slide, for we to have agile methods in place, but people don't feel particularly motivated because they don't understand their position inside the organization. Yeah. And I think if they have the room, if they understand what's going on, they are really engaged and motivated, which, by the way, we had the yellow sticky item with the retrospectives, poor morale, we didn't focus on that, but that's a very critical one. If you have motivated people, they just deliver more, they deliver more quality, they have more fun, and the customers can feel that. That's what you wanna, wanna have. So, I, I totally agree, it, it's one of my favorites as well. Unlock the intrinsic motivation. And this one, for example, decentralized decision making is one which creates a lot of fear of losing control. Happened to me. I was a waterfall project manager and I delivered successful waterfall projects. I think nothing wrong with that. It's, I think, a lot also based on what you do and, and what's ha going to happen. And when I started with Agile, I had a lot of fear of losing control. What's going on? And I had to learn that. I think decentralized decision making is not Every decision is made by someone else. It's having a framework in place, having the information that people know where they are and what they are doing, taking the right decisions. Sorry, um, I have a question about how do you, how would you suggest that the, uh, individual performance is monitored within uh, the safe so the train, etc. Because uh, there, there is a problem that I'm not sure if we're going to be able to solve really quickly. Because currently, the, the ethos that we expect we're going to adopt within the safe uh, framework is that everybody's fully empowered. <coughs> and if somebody spend, decides to spend three hours a day on Twitter, we're never going to find out until maybe the customer that's going to get fired up. How, how do you do it today in Scrum? Or if you have an agile way, maybe we have some expertise in the room. How would you answer that? Team. The team. Yeah. Team responds to that. Yeah. How, how do they respond? In retros and things like that, people start realizing non-delivery, wasting time. So the team will recognize and raise that, hopefully. If not, well, then you might have to take a little bit more of a, a structured approach. But definitely the team would be the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let's assume that every individual is, um, is more interested in, uh, in the project rather than getting out of the office at 5 o'clock without getting in trouble and hated by everybody else. And he says, you know, who, who's going to stand up and say, uh, there's a guy in my team that is not doing enough? It talks to point number eight then. Then maybe your, your workers aren't motivated. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, it's a very deep topic yeah. to go in and then we can park that and I would be happy to have a, a pizza conversation about that because there's not one single answer but I think the team is doing a lot and, and building that kind of an environment and we in Agile we don't want to have the people who work all nights right so we want to have a sustainable pace so everybody should go out of the office and if we have that environment people are motivated to work and I've seen situations where a, a team really said, okay, we cannot work with that person again, so he moved to another team where he was more happy after that. But that has nothing to do with Scrum, uh, with SAFE, that was uh, just team and Scrum. Just a little bit on that. Um, 
how about time reporting? Very good question. Yeah. So. I mean, in the context of specific tasks, yeah. for instance. I think when you are expected a certain amount of effort, then you have a certain idea of mm -hmm. how long it might take. And if you're reporting like, too much over it, quite often I would assume another member of the team should step yeah. in to help or close the circle. The circle. I, I think one of the things is we need to focus on value and return on investment, understand the effort we put in there. And I think that's the, the meetup. When is that the next one or the, the one in October where you do the WSJF, WSJF prioritization? Yeah, October. October. That's a good example. We need to focus on value. And the time, the estimation, is a good indication of how long it will take to do the forecasting. But also a very, very deep topic, which I would, if we can, defer it a little bit. Because maybe I will answer some of the questions as we go forward. Because the whole thinking process, also budgeting, can change. And, and you, you have a different approach. Because at the end, you have uh, people available who do work. And they do their best, because you build that environment. And then you can pride as you work. You do the work which is the most valuable for you at this point of time. But we can go into uh, some deeper discussions. Uh, I've seen several implementations. Typically, people go away from time recording because it's not relevant anymore. But I'm not saying there are some constraints sometimes, right? Good. Principles. So in the trainings, we focus a lot of the principles behind for those of you who have been to a training. Because leaders and managers also need to understand what's behind the framework. And then we go into the practices and you know safe. We have the, the picture scale data framework.com and you can click on every single icon on there and you get an abstract and more detailed information. Uh, so you have proven practices here, how Agile and Lean is implemented at scale. And you also have the case studies related uh, to that. So companies showing how they did it. For example, James is coming in from TomTom. Tom. You can also find a case study on the framework. So one thing is, is really you can go in, you can click, you can read everything. And maybe it looks a little bit scary because there are a lot of icons on there. You will see if you work with it a little bit and, and if you have a better understanding, it's actually not that complex. But on the other hand, we also address complex problems, right? We, we build very complex systems and software. So we need maybe a little bit more support than just Scrum on a team level. So what you see here is three levels safe. We have a team level, we have a program level, and we have a portfolio level. We typically start with teams. They are agile. Nothing beats an agile team. If you have something which can be done by five to nine people, don't scale. Doesn't make sense. If one team can build it, but if you have several teams working together, you might want to have an additional level. But let's stay at the team, cross-functional, self-organizing team. Cross-functional doesn't mean that everybody can do everything. We still have specialization in the team, but they can deliver end-to-end -end value. And one of the key things we sometimes forget, what we want to achieve is plan, do, check, adjust. The cycle, retrospective cycle. We always make mistakes, but if we can learn, what can we do better? If we have this kind of learning organization and learning team in place, then we will be successful. Team delivers value every two weeks in SAFE. So here we come to one of the challenges we've seen before. When we start to integrate, we have delays. So what we need to do if we have several teams working together, we need to integrate on a regular base. Basically daily or more than daily. Uh, avoid physical branching. And it gets interesting if, if you have hardware involved, right? You want to integrate hardware and software together, different software parts. Only if you integrate, you really see if it's working. And you can get dependencies resolved and you can get feedback very fast of the integrated solution. So if the team, team level, 
what you know from Scrum. But if you have several teams, typically we say 5 to 12 teams, 50 to 125 people, then we have the team of Agile teams and that's the so-called Agile release train or art. A team of Agile teams. They're working together on the same solution, on the same product, which we have here. So they have a synchronized cadence, so they work all on two weeks cadence, for example. They have a vision, they have a roadmap, they have architectural guidance in place so that we can work together as a team. And Des mentioned it that already, we will do a workshop, and I think that's the September one, where we do the PI planning. PI is the program increment. That's the iteration on a program level. Typically, six to 12 weeks uh, yeah, planning cadence. And every six to 12 weeks, all the people from the Agile release train come together and they plan together. So, we do a quick exercise why that would make sense. So, assume we have the flip chart here. And as a group, we are about 50 people, I would say. We would need to pull that flip chart in a direction. Now you have to trust me a little bit. Quickly look around the room. Think how you came into the building. You came down with the elevator most probably, came into the room. Now please close your eyes and point with your hand in the direction of east. <laughs> you cannot be wrong. Please keep your hand up and please open your eyes with the hands up. Quickly look around the room. So you can take your hands down. What would happen? We would pull on that flip chart, right? Some would walk in that direction, some in the other. What would happen with that one? Stay at the same place. Or maybe moves very, very slowly. By the way, I have no idea where East is here. <laughs> Thank you, you know, my, my, my brain extension and uh, great support uh, over there. That direction. Actually, East is there. Thank you. Have you seen that? In an organization, when you plan certain stuff that this was happening, someone thought, oh, it's going more in that direction. Another one thought it's going more in that direction, what we are building. We need to get alignment. We need to get the people together. And if we are together in a room and we say, we can even say, that's east for us. We all know we walk in that direction. And then we are aligned and we have much, much more power and we can pull that flip chart. And that's what we want to achieve in here alignment and we want to identify the dependencies between the teams. It's one of the most fascinating events I've had ever experienced. The, the energy which is created in there, it's just amazing. Anybody attended a PI planning? How was that? Very good. Lots of energy, lots of discussion, right? Lots of alignment happening in there. And I had a project manager coming to me in one of my, my last plannings and he said, wow, he was a waterfall project manager. He said, we just got a decision for a problem and it took us 15 minutes of discussion. And in the old approach, it would have taken us at least two and a half weeks. That's a small time difference, right? Because what we want to have in here is the right people to make decisions. And so you can get decision fast, so we can move much, much, much faster. Very, very fascinating event. So, and every two weeks we demonstrate the increment or the integrated system increment. So we make a demo of the integrated parts. Not only a team demo, all the teams together integrate their solution and demonstrate. What kind of experience do you have with that? Is that something which is easy, hard? What would you say? It's become a problem when you're trying to make a demo worldwide and there is no physical time to overlap. So you need to find other ways to do it. Cool. By the way, that's the same with the planning. If you have different time zones, 
everything is more difficult, right? Because you have to plan for that if you have distributed teams. So you need to put that into or take that into consideration. How you can address that? With the planning, it's easier. You can collect everybody on site once per PI. But with a demo, with a system demo, it happen a bit more frequent. You need to be more creative. Creative and do that. And it's really not easy, but it's really a forcing function. And it's painful to integrate the solution, right? But if something is painful and if you do it more often, it gets easier and it gets natural and we can solve a lot of problems. That's part of inspect and adapt PDCA cycle. We want to get better. So when something is painful, maybe we want to do it more often. So for example, going to the gym would help me a little bit. So we have the PDCA cycle on a team level and we have the same also on a program level. So every six to 12 weeks, the whole train comes together and learns what went well, what didn't went well, how can we address certain problems? And you have decision makers in there, so which can really remove some of the impediments. When you go up with the team level, agile teams, we scale up. We had the program level with the agile release train. And if we go up, we have a portfolio and we need to stay lean up here. One of the key things is try to identify how is value flowing in our organization. What are the value streams? That's typically the first step we do with, with safe implementations. How is value flowing? And it will be interesting how many discussions you will have when you do that. Because first of all, you think, oh, it's clear for us. But then when you go into the session and, and you have a lot of details in here and, and very, very helpful discussions to identify your value flow. We have agile budgeting and that's going back to the question, okay, do we do time recording? So interesting thought is that we assign budget to value streams. So not to projects or individual tasks. It's basically, we have a group of people. We want to have the group of people working together because we know that if we always form new teams, that's very time consuming and, and uh, expensive to do that. <coughs> so we want to funnel new work into an existing team or existing team of agile teams. And we assign some budget to the value stream with a vision and of course what we want to achieve and we have a backlog and then we prioritize that backlog with a technique which is called WSGF to learn more about in one of the next meetups. And we still have governance in place and we want to have visibility what's going on and we have a very very high level of transparency also in regards to the budget and time. What do we do with the money we invest? Basically if I have an agile team where can I see what was done with the money the past two weeks? Demonstration. Demonstration. Sprint demo. And I can do that with the, with the team of Agile teams, with the art as well. At the end of two weeks, I can see the integrated solution. We spend X thousand pounds and we can see the outcome. So it's a very, very high level of transparency, which we have here. So we have team program portfolio and now the newest addition to the framework is basically you have a button here where you can expand the framework. Some organization need an additional level which is called the value stream level. If you have thousands of people working together on the same solution, how can we synchronize that? We don't talk a lot about that but if you build a car or an airplane or a big software, maybe you have thousands of people working together. So you also need cadence and synchronization up there. You have to have governance across and within the value streams. We talk about solution intent. By the way, one of the recommendations, if you have some time maybe on the weekend, click on that icon and read that. Solution intent, fixed and variable requirements. Very interesting thought when you go through your traditional requirements list, which of these requirements are really fixed and where do we have some flexibility and some variability? If you do that exercise, you start to get trade-off options and you st start to see that you can create more and higher value. So value stream level, we don't want to go into details. But what we want to do is give you some ideas about implementations. <coughs> some of you have started to implement SAFE. What was the biggest challenge you had? Culture. 
culture. Tool selection. Tool selection. Should be, uh, any implementation should have a proper uh, leadership supervision. So if you don't get a buy-in from a top-level management, most probably it will not happen. It doesn't really matter what tools you have, how you change the culture, how how you build your communities. Uh, if there is no buy-in from the top level, it will not happen, right? So you need that leadership support, and and the other topics are important as well. Culture, especially, will also be built by the environment and the leadership because I have to lead that way and, and to change the culture. And with culture, I have to establish new new habits which help me to do that change. But we need the support, and they need to lead the change. Leaders need to lead the change. And when we have safe implementations, we typically have safe implementation one, two, three. And I will try something else. We have an artist back there, so I cannot compete with that, but I will try something here. So, first of all, we have a customer and we have a smiling customer. So the customer is sitting here at the end, whatever role he is, but I want to, when I'm going into an organization, I want him walk away with a smile, because then he's also my best salesperson. Because what he's doing, he's going to meetups or to a bar meeting his friend and he's talking about uh, what was going on and how he was successful. So how can we make him smile? Typical implementations, we get the results if we have a successful Agile release train running. How many people did we say do we, do we have on an Agile release train? 50 to 125, so that, that's about right. So a group of people working together, typically after two or three PIs, program increments, six to 12 weeks. That's when people say, okay, yeah, we can do a case study and start talking about it. So we need to make that train successful. To make that train successful, we need to have a boost here. And this boost is called the quick start. The quick start is two days of training, say for team, two days of PI planning and one day of follow-up training. One very compact week to initiate a lot of change. So this is the, the point we want to reach. So we have a milestone here. When can we launch that train? That's what we want to have. Happy smiling customer at the end. So how do we start? Typically, we need to have some change agents in the organization. And, and often that's internal or external, or most often a combination. They're going to implementing safe training, SPC certification, because then they can run trainings. And that's often done in a combination, internal and external. And what we need to do is we need to get leadership together to do a two-day leading safe training. Why do we do two-day training and not one day? Because people need to have a sleep to reflect on the information <laughs> they got during the first day. Exactly. Let's generate insights and generate questions. The next day they can ask this question. I get the biggest pushback on the second day in the morning. Yeah. I know if, if you run trainings, that, that's when, when you get a lot of, of pushback. Because we need to work on it. And if you have one day training, and I got a lot of questions, can we do it in one day? No, it will not work. Because they come in with very, very busy work, and then they settle down in breaks, some calls and, and, and uh, emails, and then they go off and they, they work on. And the information cannot 
be processed. So it's very important to have these two-day training. And there is one more uh, other uh, effect of one-day training. And when you are doing one-day training, people say, oh, can we do it at half day? Can we have it in three hours? Can we make it in one hour? Can we make a webinar in one hour? Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it's absolutely critical. And I just had a, a training with uh, a group. It was a big insurance company and they had the CIO and the C-level from the business and 55 people of their management team in that training and we extended it by one day. So basically we did uh, three days, two days of, of training. The main idea of the first two day leading safe is get a common terminology, get a common understanding, understand the principles, understand the framework. We didn't talk about the implementation of SAFE there. It was really have a common terminology, have a similar understanding. And then we did the so-called value stream workshop. And that can be run as a one day, most often can also be longer. What we do in there is the first thing, we think about the customer, we think about the future. So how? would we describe our situation in one year from now? Draft press release or press release in the future or draft case study, whatever form you have. And you also want to have really numbers in there. So quantitative and qualitative measures. How should the situation look like? It will be very interesting. You will see that this helps align people as well. We talked about alignment East before. This helps to understand what are our objectives of the transformation. We are implementing SAFE or whatever. We want to do that. Why are we doing it? Having a good understanding. In the last case, they said, oh, it's time to market. Clear for everybody. We don't need to discuss it. And we had a 90 minutes discussion afterwards because everybody had a different understanding from time to, uh, f uh, for time to market. Where do we start? Where do we end? Oh, it's from 18 months to six months. No, it's from six months to three months. And we had very good discussions to get alignment. The next thing is we try to identify how is value flowing in our, in our organization. So we identify typically value streams, typically split up into groups to do that. And then we pick the one value streams where we think that there are some criteria where we can be successful, where we can show the results. What's a good starting position? And we design our trains within those value streams. So maybe, maybe it's one, oftentimes you start one value stream, one agile release train. And then we try to have a name and a date. What's the name of this train? So this one and a date. The date is this milestones. When do we launch our train? With that we have set a time box. Typically between two weeks and ten weeks. It's a good time frame. Train the leaders, understand how you want to start, and then start the first train. With that time box, we can then create our, where do we have it? Our backlog, and that's a transformation backlog. What do we need to do between here and here to be ready to launch our train? So you start to create your backlog items. And that's not the backlog items which will be implemented by the Agile release train, it's the backlog items which are the transformation. And then you start to work on that, you know when you launch your train, you launch it and you typically get the results. And that's what we have here. Train the change agents, train executive leaders leading safe. We do the initial part to define what is our train that's the HR release train. And then we train the practitioners, developers, testers, other people on the train, and we launch it. We do the first PI planning. And then we get the results. That's typically how safe implementation start. Then we have the first terrain, we go to the next one, and so on, and we spread it in the organization. And of course, inspect and adapt, right? Would make sense. Any questions to that?
So we can also talk more during the break. So just some examples, define transformation objectives, lean agile principle assessment, identify the value streams, select the first one, define the trains, and then create the plan. So you walk out of this third day, you have an idea, what, where do you start? What do you need to do? It's a very concrete plan to go off. But we as humans that before uh, lead and safe a workshop, we already have a proper uh, leadership support in the organization. You have it before or you build it yeah. in here. That's typically the forcing function. In the insurance company, that's what we did. Here, that's, w that's where we built the alignment. So we didn't know if we will start or do save after the three days. Mm -hmm. But we worked it out in that time frame. And then just some more details. That's this one week launch. And I've never seen so much change happening in such a short time before. And we have here safe for teams. It's, it's training for the teams. And it's not so much about the training itself because some of the teams or most of the teams know Scrum or Kanban already. But again, we want to get a common language, common terminology. We want to work as a team, create working agreements, definition of done, get familiar with the backlog. And then we can already do the PI planning, program increment planning for the next about three months. That's where we get a commitment. That's where we get visibility, predictability, what's going on, what's happening in the next three months. And then some follow-up training. Some organizations then also need to, if you have a large organization, maybe you want to share some of the practices. Uh, so if you're adopting SAFE, you're adopting it. Typically you make some changes. It's a framework. You need to make it yours. Maybe you add some stuff, you share it. Uh, so you can tailor fit the framework. There's also a product called Enterprise Safe to do that, where you can build your instance and add your learnings and share with other parts of the organization. So there are ways to customize. It's always good to go back to the principles. If you want to do a change on the framework, go back to the nine principles. Is it supported by those principles or not? It gives you a good direction because you can customize something in a completely wrong way. And SAFE is a framework, it will not guarantee success, but it gives you some good guidance. But you still need to think and how to apply it. Do that. So then you get results. And that's what we want to have. We want to win in some games. We want to win. We want to show the results. And just some examples of, of results, business results, people got implementing SAFE. Uh, that's typically the most often time, this time to market is the key thing people want to have. But also defect reduction, productivity as well. But I always ask the question, maybe the question to you. So you want to have higher productivity, of course, right? If you have to choose between productivity and predictability, what would you choose? Which one? Productivity. productivity? How do you measure productivity? System, any stable system should be predictable. So it's interesting, and I get both of the answers, but the tendency goes in predictability, because oftentimes productivity can, is very hard to measure, and we always want to have more. But the biggest fear of, of a leader is to say, okay, to commit something to someone, yet we will deliver it that at this point of time and then he cannot deliver and he need to go there and say oh yeah we are not ready with that that's very embarrassing so if they have to decide oftentimes they go more for predictability and that, that's what we want to what we want to create and by the way happier more motivated employees that's typically a proxy for that one because if we have happy employees they work more they deliver better quality you get better results going back to the yellow sticky at the, at the beginning, right? And finding the ways, uncover ways to better support our customers and build better software and systems. So you can also find case studies on the framework. Intel is up there, Lego, TomTom. Tom. Just mentioned and he will be here and explain the case study. You can read a little bit so you can ask him the difficult questions. And you will see that not everything is perfect. Implementations are challenging. So you get some ideas, 
and you've seen the numbers from this before. Just a quick update because it's interesting to see the change. So that was at the end of 2015 and I've just realized that I've not included the latest information but I think at the moment we are about 75% of the Fortune 100 in the US. The global Fortune 500 is starting going up. We have about, I think in the meantime, about 60,000 trained practitioners and about 4,000 uh, trainers who really practice and work with the framework. And the good thing is, all what we see here, case studies, people doing it, all this information also comes back and goes back into the framework to make this one back better. All the learnings go back into the framework. And that's, there will be a new version. I don't know if it will be number, say, five or whatever, but all the learnings are going back. And you can see learnings when you go on the framework. There's a blog. All the changes up, are up there. So there's just a new article on community of practice, updated article. Has anyone seen Essential Safe? Latest blog post. What's the minimal things you need to do to call it safe? It's basically team and program level and just a little bit on a portfolio to identify your value streams. But you don't need everything up here. So you can start here on a program level. That's typically the start. You don't need to have a, a perfect portfolio. You start with an agile release train. And then you move it up into this level. And then after that you scale up, you added more and more trains. Exactly, and, and we see organizations, they do this one, basically several instances of SAFE if you have a, a large organization, or a portfolio of portfolios. It's basically a very modular and, and scalable model. Start small, get the learnings, and then do really PDCA cycles, inspect and adapt, and get it, get it growing. So there are a lot of ways to get the knowledge, go to the framework, but maybe you also want to go to a training. We, we say two things, train everybody and launch HR release train to be successful. And why training? It, it happened to me, I had the pleasure to learn to fly helicopters. And I, re I was reading a lot of books, how this works. Do we have any pilots here? No. So, it was very easy to read and, and I played it in my mind and I remember the first time I was sitting in a helicopter and I had to do it. Nothing worked. I was not able to stabilize the helicopter for 15 seconds. It was just unstable immediately. And I've read a lot of stuff, but I had to have some training, some guidance, some lessons to do that. And that's the same in technical stuff we do or when we implement Agile in the framework. Get the training. So, be agile, like a fish. You scale up, you want to be bigger, but you still want to stay lean. And the interesting part is, the new world is not the big fish, which is the small fish, it's the fast fish, which is the slow fish. So we need to be fast, time to market. So we are at the end of the time box and have some, or time box for the talk, but maybe have some time for questions and I think we have a lot of experts in the room. I have a question. Oh. How you overcome the problems that uh, a lot of big organizations uh, really get the benefit of doing agile without being agile? And they even don't want to move to the direction of being agile because they already get a lot of just doing agile. And then moving on. Do you want to repeat the question? So okay. So the, the, the question, when you're doing Agile, you just do some practices, but you are not really being Agile, right? Mm -hmm. That was the question. You just you, follow, you, you just follow you, the practice and without understanding and without constantly improving for that. Yeah. So you already get results, but just by applying some of the, the practices. Mm -hmm. How do you do the next step? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very good question. I think it's... My experience, the mentality of getting the inspect and adapt the PDCA cycle implemented on all the different levels that we always try to get better on a team level, on a program level, on a portfolio level, that to get that in the mindset of a learning organization. 
and then work with impediment backlogs. So we have some, some experts in the room. What, what do you think? What, how, how have you seen or what, how have you approached that problem? I think uh, Shuhari comes to mind with regards to your question, right? Uh, yes, but you know, the problem is when you're talking with as, as senior vice president levels, they don't care about the process actually. Yeah. That happened inside his organization. He has an org of 5,000, 10,000 people. He don't care. He has his strategical goal. And, <coughs> and when you're trying to approach to this level, say, hey, dude, let's rethink what we're doing. He said, I don't know. I yeah. give a so, question was very, very high level. If you have VPs up there, how can you get them involved? Which is sometimes uh, yeah. challenging to get them. Yeah. Also, for example, you want to get high level people, high level executives to the PI planning. Sure. You will see the impact. And it's good if they see it, they will come again next time. I think that the big challenge is to get them the first time. And then that's how you initiate the change. But I think that that's also the art. Not this art, it's the art how you do this, this change and, and this implementation. But it's very important to get that route because at the moment we are agile and safe. In 10, 15 years, there might be something else and we need to adjust to that, uh, that environment. And the organizations which have this flexibility, who are learning organizations, they will be very successful in the market because they can do that. Yeah. Okay. I may have misunderstood it around the sprint demo that we gave the I think your value of the sprint demo is understand your value of the sprint demo. I've never found the sprint demo to give me to understand my business value. It's more to understand what's, what's the cost and what I've actually built around that. I think um, the only value you don't get to derive is when it's been deployed into life and actually get to that point. Yeah. So the, the, the point was. Uh, you don't really see the value at the at the sprint demo. It's really there when it is deployed to production. Yes. Yeah. Of of course, I think oftentimes you can maybe deploy to production already, or you have pre-production system. But I think showing what was done and and get the feeling, yeah, is it ready and what is the right time then to move it pro to production? By the way, that's an interesting thing and also misunderstanding about safe. How often do we release in safe, release to production? As soon as we are ready. As soon as we are ready and the customers are ready. So some people read the framework, yeah, you deliver to production every three months. That's totally wrong. So we have organizations, they do it every couple of minutes. We have organizations, they do it every, half, every six months. That's totally fine. It's not an IT decision anymore. It's more a business decision. When do we have enough value? What's the right time for a customer? to release value. And I think that's, that's a big mindset shift and that gets some people involved also. Oh, there is some change. Oh, maybe you can do the next step as well. I think there are some internal inconsistencies within say They argue that um, teams should be consistent, that you should keep teams together in a, inside a tray, which is quite a reasonable thing to say. But then they equally want to prescribe the systems used for the agile teams quite in quite a detailed manner by using certain techniques from extreme programming, rather than saying the agile teams, once formed, can make some of those decisions themselves about exactly how they implement their agile team. Can you get a little bit more concrete about the, the guidance? And so just, just for the camera, there, there is a conflict on how much guidance is given, how much prescription, and yes, how much flexibility. I'm going to use that word intentionally. OK. Um, if you, whether or not you keep teams together or not is, over time, is debatable, depending on the different views on that. But if you take the view that they take in this system, that you should keep teams together over a longer period, and simultaneously say they should all work in the same way, there's no real benefit to that. There's benefit to, ca to cadence having things happen at the same time, but how the team self-organize doesn't have to be the same if the teams are going to stay together. If, That's on the other hand, you decide that you're going to move people between teams depending on the tasks, then there are advantages to insisting that people use similar methods in all the teams. Yeah. Uh, two things. Where do we say that all the teams need to work the same way? Where does SAFE say that? 
So it basically talks about the agile teams at the bottom and using extreme programming methods. In fact, they use that term for the teams. It's, I can't remember the exact term for it. But yeah. It doesn't involve an agile team. It's a specific name for them. I, I think we have seen teams, some do Scrum, some do Kanban, some do uh, uh, extreme programming practices are, are used across teams. But I've seen teams, not in the software area, which maybe have not used a lot of the, the, the more technical XP practices, some, some others, but th there's not really a... I think there's a lot of flexibility and th that's part of the PDCA cycle. Possibly, but as I said, there are advantages to what's suggested if the team, if members are going to move between groups because they new, move into a new group and are familiar with the methods that are being used. But if the groups, the teams are to be kept together, yeah. then it isn't necessarily advantageous to insist on that. Yeah. So there are people also moving across the teams and, and I think one of the, the advantages I just had a, a, a someone from a big bank and he said I had to extend my team and I had to hire new people in, in India to, to onboard them. I just trained them and they had the same approach so it was very fast integration so I'm not saying that there are no changes in the team because they, they are typically changes in, in the team but we still want to have it as stable as possible but I think that there's flexibility. I'm not sure that as stable as possible is really desirable over a slightly longer term. I think it may be better to put teams together by build drits, yeah. by okay. drill bits, use them and then chuck them away and build a new build drill. Uh, drill bit. Let me maybe help. There is two answers to what we are just talking about. First of all, it's a, we are really a horizontal scalability. Well, this is what my friend was talking about. So it's in, when you have this framework, it's easy to scale up horizontally. But to scale up horizontally, you need a lot. So measure it well, well, well. I'm not I'm not self-organized but not self-government. They got governments, why is it? We ask them to align with the features and enablers. We're building. That's it. This is our requirements. That's, that's everything we want from you. Follow the program level process, but you can do mm -hmm. whatever you want on your team level. That's not actually what describes uh, best practice. Yes, but again, this is best practice. It's not that you must do it. Of course not. You don't have to do anything that's in there, but it's very much an emphasis that's put on the scaled Agile framework on how to organize the Scrum teams. I, I, I can tell you what was the reason behind it. I can guess, Michael. I was talking with, uh, with Dan about it actually a couple of years ago. Uh, the idea was to boost the process because without providing an initial framework, people thinking about safe like a Scrum. Scrum telling you, you should do that, that, and that, and after that you benefit. If you are not doing what Scrum is telling you, you will not benefit. So the idea was given like, you know, base skeleton and say, guys, if you don't know what to do, this is our recommendation. If you're smart enough, adapt. Change, do whatever you want, but still you need to have alignment. And this is the way how we prescribe you to make that to shift the alignment. So this is a bit tricky. I would say the important thing that where we're suffering, where we're suffering in 2010, for example, based on the version one report, was in program management, product management. This was the guys who had the weakest position because they were struggling between development level and portfolio level. And they tell you, okay, we're solving this problem, but we should also give you something on the baseline and on portfolio level. I think it's a, it's a starting position, right? We, where there is a lot of flexibility, and especially if you go forward and you, you have these learnings, you adjust to the, to the way which makes sense. And I've seen a lot of different implementations, some with more changes, some with, uh, with less. I think the pizza is getting cold, right? Yeah, I mean, sort of Sorry for that. So the pizza is here. <laughs> and the drinks are over the back as well. So this break now, let's carry on the conversations. Um, you know, we've got the room till 9 o'clock, so if you know going to say it's 9, I, I will be here till 9 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> no Me too. Go. I have no home. <laughs> but this, so that, this uh, can I just say thank you for Michael, literally for flying in. Thank you. the video on the channel was without the link to you as well uh, we'll try and get the desperate recording up as well um, but yeah thank you for coming and let's get some food and some drink thank yes. you